Welcome to Rise and Thrive Conversations for Greatness, the podcast. Today, I'm diving deep into the realms of personal growth, motivation, and inspiration with a guest whose name is synonymous with success. Meet a titan of the world of sales with an extensive track record of sales overachievement. As a senior sales executive, she has proven herself to be a formidable sales hunter and relationship manager. Our guest has mastered the art of selling professional services and licenses, closing deals into the millions of dollars. She's a trusted advisor to clients, including C-level executives. She's a powerhouse in driving innovation and growth. Today, she's here to share her journey, insights, and secrets behind her success. Join us as we explore the landscape of personal growth and success with a truly inspirational goddess. Welcome Renee Mercus to the show. Hi, we need some clapping after that. <laughs> Thank you very much for that intro. Wow, you do a lot of research and it's uh, very uplifting, which is the purpose of today. So thank you. I really appreciate it, John. No worries. I don't think a lot of people can call you a goddess, but I can get away with it. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I want my colleagues, but I have been called the Southern Queen of Sales because I am in the south of, you know, of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. We'll go with the, with the Southern Queen. I like it. I like it. <laughs> oh. Now, Rise and, Rise and Thrivers, this was one of the hardest interviews to secure that I've had so far in my podcasting career. And I guess we should let the cat out of the bag now, Renee, shouldn't we? I think so. We're married. <laughs> We've been married. We're coming up for 15 years. We got together when we were both about 38 and a half. We're the same age. And I used my sales strategies to help secure finding a lifelong partner. I hadn't been very successful in meeting my life partner. And so I thought, well, what can I do? So I turned to sales. I've had very good success throughout my career. I got a coach. So that for me was a, a therapist. I went to back then Borders bookstore in South Yarra in Victoria and bought every single self-help book. And that was all about my training. And then I went, well, where's my target audience? So that's where as a hunter, as a sales hunter, you've got to go find where's my pool of people that will, you know, buy, <laughs> you know, or, you know, move forward with a sale. And so back then it was, I went on to RSVP and then put my pro, my, my profile up. And then I didn't just get, I had a peer review because my target audience was, I wanted to find a, a husband. So I had a couple of my male um, colleagues actually look at my profile to make sure I didn't sound like a crazy woman. And I had that lightheartedness. And then I would also do trial closes. So, you know, if someone asked me out, I would say yes, because I then had to test how I was because I was obviously not performing at my optimum capability and getting the goals that I wanted. So, and then luckily you then popped into my life and it's all worked out beautifully. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great to be the target of, a, of the inside, but I like your approach, that planned approach to mm -hmm. getting and achieving what you want to achieve. Yeah, to achieve those results. And you certainly did. I think you might have mentioned it's been 15 years. We're coming up to our wedding anniversary, 15 beautiful years. As you mentioned, we did start a bit late in terms of we were in our late 30s and we both wanted to have a family and it worked out. Yeah, I think I always had this optimistic feeling that it was going to work out. I had this half glass, you know, that full glass and I'd leave my whole... <laughs> so, so, because... This is perfect, Renee, everyone. And as we say in the family, classic Renee. My mother used to do it as well. Renee does it. I think we all we all do it. But the thing is sometimes those um The words get jumbled. Might get uh, might get a little bit uh, a little bit jumbled. Yeah, and I think that's partly because my brain is working. I have I think I've got a pretty fast brain, and sometimes my it doesn't connect with what I'm saying in my brain. Yeah, and so I have to actually remind myself to slow down because I talk quite fast. And so when I'm presenting, I have to, you know, some of the training that I've had, you deepen your voice to be more authoritarian, deepen your voice and slow down. You were just talking about how we wanted to have a family. And I just felt very optimistic that it was going to work out because I do have a half glass full approach to life. It's like, well, you know, what can we do to make this possible and then go for it? And then th things don't always work out. You know, there's, you sometimes have bad luck along the way, but then it's like, how do you deal with that? So we would have become foster parents, for an example. If we couldn't have our own children, we would have had lots of pets and foster children. 
So there's always a way, Renee, you've got this attitude of there's always a way, we'll find yep. a way, we'll make it happen, always optimistic. And so it's no, no surprise that I was very attracted to that. And you've made our family just awesome because of, because of that. So Renee's in a world of possibility and how can we make it happen? And I, I guess because that's how you need to be in your career as well. Yeah, uh, and as you said, things don't always work out, but there you need to. I don't know. Keep going. Find another way. Take some more action. Things like that. So, can you tell us about you know what you think and what you do in your career? And I know that'll spill over to your personal life, but in your career to achieve things and or if things don't work out, what are the kind of things you're thinking and doing? So someone said to me that, you know, you have this approach of quick wins, fail fast, fail fast, quick wins. And it's true, you know, in sales, you have to put a plan together and then you've got to have a plan B, C and D because you've just got to have tenacity and have courage as well. So there, um, when I was younger, I read this book, Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. So you might know that book, John. Yeah, I certainly do. You've probably got it behind you. <laughs> I do. Yes, Susan Jeffers, yes. who's no longer with us, actually. So what a legacy. It's an amazing book. I read that book when I was in my mid-20s, and that sort of helped transform my life because we just it's one of those innate behaviours. But I think that, you know, danger's real, but fear is manageable. So I remember when I, I was one of the major banks and I looked after that as an account executive and wanted to, all roads were leading to this particular person. And I was really scared about calling this person, this C-level person who would, could help make or break part of my, not just career, but the activities that I was doing, the success I was having at the time. So I call it my big girl pants, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> to get that courage and to put those on right? And I also say to myself, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. So I sat down, I had a chat to myself and said, okay, what is your goal? And my goal was bigger than my fear. It's really important. That motivates me all the time. My goal was bigger than my fear. You're giving me goosebumps already with all the things that you're saying. So danger is real. Fear is manageable. That is amazing. I know you're giving us an example and I've cut in on the example there, but I just okay. want to highlight how amazing that is. The big girl pants or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, to, whatever you know, works for you. So not suck up the courage, but get the courage to take the action that you need to take. And the last thing you just said before I cut in there was also amazing. Your goals are bigger than your fear. And you hear that often where people say, if your dream is big enough, you'll take the action. It depends on how much you want something. And I yeah. was wanting it. I wanted to build a better life for us. I wanted to build a better life for myself. I wanted to build a life where I had a lot of choices as a woman. And, you know, and as I said, also for the family and for my career as well. So my goal was huge and I needed this person. So I, I remember, you know, that he was the king and I was kind of like, you know, just one of the little people around him. I put a phone call in, I got his phone number, rang this man and he answered. It's like, okay, I'm on. So I said, you know, can I meet with you? No. Um, are you sure? No. And then I, I used some humour, which is like, you know, where the court jester sometimes can make uh, make change and uh, move things forward. So I then said, oh, do you eat lunch? Oh, yes. Okay. Let me take you out for a sandwich. And then that's how it started. And so then I, I cracked open this account and uh, was very successful. But it's just an example where, whereby I wanted it that badly that I then thought about it, planned it. And then in the moment, you also use obviously your instincts and, and your humour or whatever it takes to get the outcome that I was desiring. Well, you are a very funny person. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Glad you think so. And you enjoy humour and a good laugh, and I think that is uh, essential to a good marriage, which we have and we often laugh. And you're really good at being able to laugh at yourself as well and not take yourself too seriously on, on occasions. And I think that's a really good asset because it then allows you not to get caught up in knots about uh, about things and have a, bit of, have a bit of laugh, be happy on the way, be happy on the journey that you are taking. And someone said, Ask me once, what's the best thing you like about Renee? And I said, you know, there's so many things, but, you know, most of the time she's happy. Yeah. 
Yeah, I am. Yeah. But you make his, it's not that you make yourself happy, but you. I choose. You, I choose to be yeah. happy. I yeah. choose to be happy. So I, as you know, and I might get a bit teary because I think as a parent, it's a pretty horrific story. But as a, as a kid, I had pneumonia and almost died repeatedly. And you've heard the story where my parents were told to rush from one side of Melbourne to the other because if you don't get her to into an oxygen tent, she could be dead within the next hour. So, and then you just think as a parent, wow, imagine that. And then that then impacted my life, I think, about I because my lungs weren't strong. So I spent most of my childhood, about 50% of my childhood at home and with my mum looking after me so that I, I would grow stronger and live and thrive and everything like that. So I think that that what's happened to me and the hardships to survive, I think, you know, you can turn it into a victim or you can turn it into something that, no, I'm going to rejoice and live every day. And if something happened and I, I left this earth tomorrow, I could look back and go, I've achieved everything. I've achieved everything I ever wanted with a family, beautiful parents, amazing friends, incredible relatives, and a great job. <laughs> yep, I'm very proud of what I've achieved. Yeah, and so and so you should be, as we have a absolute, uh, absolutely great life. Yeah, we do. Now we're going to pause because I got a tear running down my face. <laughs> Let me just collect myself. Was that too emotional? That's all right. That was awesome. You didn't say you had an awesome husband, but I just assume I'm in the family. Uh, yeah, category. you're the family. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you have a lot of sayings and expressions that you use that help you in your job and, and helps you in your personal life. And I love it when you say them because they really resonate with me as well. And it's inspiring for me to hear. And I, I would imagine others because you, you're saying this to other people as well. What are some of your favorites that you espouse to others and that help motivate you? Um, I think so. Oh, I do. I have a lot that motivates me. One of them is uh, reach for the stars because the clouds will always catch you. So go for it. So, <laughs> so when I've looked at uh, career opportunities, I have thought to myself, you know, sink or swim and be that swan on the top and paddle really fast <laughs> and do everything you can to learn so that then, oh, yeah, you're calm. You look like you're authoritarian in that role. And however, underneath you're, you know, scared <laughs> to death. I've taken uh, roles where, you know, they've been uh, presented to me. I've been asked and I've just jumped. Someone said to me, I took a role when in Sydney Olympics with Telstra. This is decades ago. And it was in a field that it was such a, it was a privilege because I was on the, I, I moved from Melbourne to Sydney for this role and I was really unsure about it at the time. And someone said to me, it's the opportunities that presented themselves that you didn't take, that you had the greatest regrets. The opportunities that presented themselves that you didn't take, that you had the biggest regret. And I just, so at the time I went, ah, oh, so that was you know, late 90s when I when that and I've kind of lived by that as well. So if there is an opportunity, weigh it up, do the evaluation. You and I have even sat down when I've had two job offers and evaluated, well, you know, one of them's got to be on the monetary side because that's very important that, you know, the more you earn, the sometimes the better quality of life. You know, you can afford your health care, live in a comfortable home. And, and so we've evaluated from a financial perspective but then it's also what's going to be good for your career and what's going to be good for your family. And I've turned down jobs that have offered more money because they I'd be having to get up and, and um, sales meetings typically with that culture started at seven in the morning. And when I had a young family, that that was the, the life balance wasn't money. It wasn't worth it. That's really important, I think, for people listening as well, because money's important and it does give you options, like you're saying. Sometimes it's not everything. If you've got a young family and you're getting a job offer and the expectations are massive and it doesn't fit with your lifestyle goals as well and your family goals, that sometimes you just have to say, no, that doesn't suit and trust that things will work out and take more action and do what you need to do. And it has always had always worked out for you and so you started saying about reach for the stars as the clouds will always catch you which I think is an amazing uh, expression. 
I, I love that because so if we had a marble fireplace, I'd love to have that etched in. It's just because it's so inspirational. You, it, I think being a parent as well, like I had really good parents. I had when I was about eight years old, we were driving down a road called Stud Road and we were going off to rhythmic gymnastics. And I said to my mum at the time, I don't really think I want to do that. So she turned the car around and we're sitting under all these amazing pine trees. And she said to me, Renee, what do you want to do? And I went, I think I want to do softball. But it wasn't just about that. It was about having parents that said, you can, so you can do or be whatever you want to be. You can do, you don't have limits. They never looked at me and said, oh, you've got a brother and you've got a sister and so you, um, you have to be small. You could do, what do you want to do? So in that moment, if I wanted to be prime minister, it was, okay, let's go make that happen. <laughs> mm, and so mm. I then did base uh, softball, but it then taught me that you've got, I've got this amazing safety net. And so that safety net, net may not, you may not have the same family that I've had that catches me at every turn or says, really just go for it. You know, what do you want to do? But it's whatever, what's your safety net that you put in place? So that could be your friends or it could be anything else that you might then have a massive savings bucket. You might have hobbies that catch you, you know. So mine's my family, my parents, but it could be anything that, and so just reach for those stars. Yep. Yeah. Why not? Why not? I mean, we all get a certain slice of time in the, in time. the millions of years that the universe has been around. We only get a, a, a small tick of the clock. So what are you going to do with your tick of the clock? Well, that's right. I love it how uh, that saying really inspires you. You've got a couple more. I can throw them at you because I know them. Do you want me to give you one? Yeah, yeah, yep. You give it to all me. All right. Here's another classic uh, one from Renee or the one that she says, she says uh, often or lives by. Chase that dream as it won't chase you back. Yeah. What's so, all that about? Okay, so I um, it's a country music uh, line, song line, but it, I heard it recently and it just encapsulates a lot of, of the way I live my life. So, for an example, you know, sales is a, is, it's a team sport, but it's a lone sport as well. So that's why I really like it because if you're doing business development, chasing opportunity, like leads that turn into opportunities, you have to go and chase it. You've got to then write all of the outreaches and do all the research. And But you then also have a team that can do peer review and everything. But you have to chase it. You have to make it happen. No one else is going to go and get those leads for you. And the more you work and the smarter you work. So it's not just about working hard because that's just spinning, can be just spinning your wheels. You also have to work and be smart about it. So sit down and plan what you're trying to achieve. Orchestrate your own life. Orchestrate where you want to go and chase it. So I, when people have said to me in job interviews, you know, what's your sales style? And I'm definitely a hunter. I go hunt. I go find new opportunities. I build those relationships. There's, you know, we get measured. Uh, one of the metrics is we get measured on how many like digital outreaches that I've either sent to, a, to like a client or they've sent it to me. And I'm always in the top statistics because I'm always outreaching. But, you know, you don't get that many back. So you just got to, you've got to find a way to make it happen. And sometimes, as I said earlier before, you know, win fast or fail, fa fail fast, win quickly. Change that, please. I'll say that again. Win, um, fail fast, win quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to take, I'm not going to take it out because it's perfect, Renee. I love oh, you know, when uh, I work, I talk so fast in my brain yeah, and then I'm on to the next thing. Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, okay, next. Yeah, so I've got to slow down yeah. sometimes. Yeah, no, that's all right. That reminds me of another good Renee saying, activity begets activity. Oh, I say that every time, all yes. the time. That's, um, that's, that you are right. Activity begets activity. So if you don't do anything, typically nothing's going to happen. So, and it, it's not always, sometimes I don't know the right move. Like in sales, do I call that person? Do I call that person? What is my next move? But if you don't make any move, nothing happens so you know you make a ripple effect you start something you have a conversation and then something else comes from that and then mm. you've got the ability to to put a plan together 
you know, and um, Henry Ford says, you know, nothing happens without a sale. You know, it's, it's basically that. For you, that is, yeah. So nothing. Yeah. Activity, be- so we're talking activity begets activity. I like what you're saying there because for people that are listening, if there's something that you want, a dream that you're going for, take some action because like you're saying, Renee, nothing's going to happen unless you do something. I really yep. like I really like that attitude. And even if you don't know what to do, do something because that is like a chain in a series of events that will take you to where you want to go. Absolutely. And you, if you didn't take the action, you wouldn't be linking those links in the chain to get where you want to go. So I have a couple of girlfriends who are trying to meet partners. And what I like about them is that this year, they're going to do things differently. Things haven't worked out for them. So then they're going to try a different path. So, but they're still trying. They're still taking that action to create the change and the outcomes that they're seeking for their lives, which is outstanding. So you can apply it to whether or not it's in your personal life or in um, your business life. And when I mean fail fast, win quickly, it's uh, if, if one strategy doesn't work, then try something else. And then that activity creates a bigger plan, more input, so that then you do know the direction. And so when you need to create you know, this plan for your life, you then have more inf- information. Information gives you the ability to make informed decisions. That's another one that I've always said, because without that information, you're working in a vacuum. And how do you know that that's the right path for you, your life, your family, your career? Exactly. And that leads into another classic, Renee, the process will take care of the outcome. So you've touched on that a, a, a little bit a little bit there with what you've said. Do you want to add to anything or is that pretty self-explanatory? No, no, no. I think I, I do. I said the process takes care of the outcome. So, you know, I've got a sales approach. I've got a sales methodology. I've had lots of training in sales and then you also use your instincts. So it's just about turning up. It's about doing the work. If you just stick to what you need to do, then the outcome, which is me typically, is getting a sale, is closing a sale. But you need a thousand activities sometimes just to do that. And it's all those one percenters. It's you going beyond and work, taking that extra 10 minutes to, to finesse a, a plan or a thought or a proposal. And so then, and it could be in anything in life, like, you know, whether or not you're uh, wanting to be more healthy so it's every single pro- part of that process and, and taking all the right decisions and the activity to then getting a healthy life, health, being healthier, winning that sale. Yeah, so I, I live by that all the time and it motivates me as well to do to take that next step because sometimes, you know, with everyone, you just like, oh, you waver, but follow the process and then you get your, then you're more than likely going to be successful. Beautiful, beautiful. You also touched on there a couple of girlfriends that are looking for partners they are going to do some things differently. So you are a fixer or a problem <laughs> yes. solver, I should say. <laughs> and don't you so, love that, darling? I do. You know, a lot of people say in relationships with men and women that the men have to stop solving and just listening. <laughs> It's the reverse in our, in our relationship. I was like, can you just listen? Yeah. I don't want you to fix anything. But I know where that comes from. It comes yeah. from a place of love and wanting to help. And because you're doing that every day in your business life, you're solving yeah. problems, you're bringing people together, you're making things happen, and that, that spills over into your personal life. So you have successfully matched make some match made some people because you're a you're a you're a problem solver and if someone says and bring people together that's right if someone says i've got a problem or a challenge in this area and you say that to an a you are going to get a, a a lot of good advice and things to action yeah well that's right i think also i have helped with a couple of relationships and the other thing is just about the different there are differences in men and women the way that we just with the millions of years of evolution and how we approach a problem and 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 a solution and i have worked in a male dominated environment i'm the currently i'm now back to being the only in the person in my team the only uh, woman in my team i report into a woman but all my peers are men. And sometimes I've been in sales teams where there's 30 men and there's just me. You know, mm-hmm. so so you've had to so I've had to adapt 
working in a more male dominated environment. And then sometimes obviously that spills over. So being a senior sales, either executive director, I have to take sometimes control of a situation. And more often than not, I'm successful in doing that. And I'm still learning, like I'm still, there's still things that I can do better. And I hope that when someone explains me, talks about me, or I talk about myself, it's about I have a learning culture. I still, I want to continue to always evolve, always grow, new, learn new skills, both interpersonal and also, you know, um, st- like from a strategic sales perspective. It is, it has been really challenging for me to, to even, I think that's one of the reasons why I found it hard to find a husband is because I took on, I'm not saying male energy, but more of that problem solver and I'm competent. I'm, I'm a very competent person and sometimes I can be more competent than the men around me in, in my relationships and I just have to even let that go. So uh, because the, the, it's, it's more important is a harmonious environment than me always being, being right or do it, being able to do something better. That's not important. You, when you look back on your life, in your personal relationships, being right doesn't, I don't think that that creates a harmonious, happy relationship. I think uh, it's got to be more balanced than that. If that. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And it reminds me of the saying, it's better to be kind rather oh, than right. We teach that to our kids all the time. Correcting someone, being the be, you know the, the the know it all in the room. I don't think that that's not how you win and, and influence people. I think being kind and having integrity, you know, and then you've got to obviously be sometimes not cutthroat, but you do have to make big decisions on in my career of what's going to get the best outcome. And sometimes they can be hard decisions, and also motivating a team of people who are very smart around me and how do you formulate that team when you're the only woman in a room yeah it can be it has been very tricky throughout the years and I've had to learn some of how to take a little bit of control and sometimes you lead from the front and you also lead from behind and 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 ask your team so that then they can have their moments and then they can help accelerate what you need to do and achieve for your end goals. Because I was going to ask you, how do you motivate your team? So, but what I can hear from what you've said is that you listen to them sometimes. I love it how you said you lead from the front. Sometimes you lead from from the behind. That, 100%. That's real. Yeah, that's that's really important. Listening, not always having to challenge, but challenge when you feel that is going to achieve a better outcome. Not challenge for the sake of challenging or for the sake of ego or any or anything like that. So I leave the egos at the door. I work with it. Obviously, we all. <laughs> working sometimes where there are different egos different and and it can be really challenging but for me with my team I don't have an ego I I, well I try not to anyway I I don't think that I've got this um, I have a big personality but I don't think I have a big ego because I don't think that I think the ego gets in the way of good judgment good decisions teamwork how to build a team how to thank a team we had a really good success, uh, successful year last year and uh, I made sure that I wrote uh, and personalised all my thank yous, acknowledging my team for what they've helped because, as I said, it is, it is also a lone sport but it's a team sport. So how do you recognise and don't just take the glory because, yes, you can be this, that salesperson but there's so many other people that help to help the success, that propel the success, that create the success. I love that acknowledgement part of the whole process and recognizing people and I really like how you personalize it because I was I'd imagine that would make a really big difference instead of sending a group email to go hi team thanks very much it's been great and then I had the some of my team write back to me and thank me and everything because without them it's like even at home you know like I can't tomorrow I'm flying out to Sydney and I can't do it all. So you're going to take some of the load. You're going to do it all for the next week. So in this job that I've got now, I don't travel as much. But in the past, I've traveled extensively throughout my career. And you've you've been the one that has picked up a lot of the home duties so that then I can have the career. I don't think a man or a woman with a family can do it alone. You need, you need to be a good partnership and a good team. And we've certainly been that for each other. So I think it's really important for everyone <laughs> to choose the right partner that supports you and wants the best for you personally and professionally. 
Nice. I don't mind taking the load. <laughs> so another thing that you say that really makes a difference to your world and to others, and I use this one all the time as well, words create your world. Tell us how you oh, discover that and how you use that and what happens yeah. with words create your world. Why do you love it, etc. cetera? Um, yeah, well, I do love it. So a lot of, you know, negative self-talk that goes into your subconscious and so that doesn't serve you. You know, you can you can decide when it, when there's a situation how you want to react to it, how, what you want that to mean to you. You can make it mean that it's empowering or the opposite. So why not, you know, you're in charge of your own key, king, keys to the kingdom, keys to your soul. So when the kids say that sometimes as well, that it's like, no, 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 choose something empowering, make it mean something. So words create your world. So, and I'm not saying I don't look in the mirror every day and go, oh, you're the best, Renee, you're successful and all of this sort of thing. Not at all. I, but if I do have negative thoughts, you know, creep in, I stop them. I have consciousness to stop those and then turn it in because I want to, I choose, we, we talked about, I choose to be happy. I choose to have if things aren't going the way I want or I need, then I look at, well, what can I do to make that change as well? What action can you take to change your trajectory, to do more, be more? And so having words create your world is underlines how you speak to yourself and how you are kind to yourself and how you just don't get into all the crap about the negativity and you know, and I have some of my friends that don't be, aren't on a lot of social media because it's taking them away from their goals. So don't go down any rabbit warrens. I don't do a lot of gossip. You know, I don't I don't want to gossip because it doesn't serve me. It doesn't. It wastes my time. I don't sit around gossiping with uh, girls or guys because it does not serve me and what I'm trying to achieve with my life. That's marvellous. And to have the awareness, I like you, how you said it, of the awareness to know that that's happening and then stop it, literally, you said, and stop it. So uh, that's really, really powerful. I am a very lucky man because I get to live with Renee and hear this kind of thing all the time, which I love. I love talking about this kind of stuff with you. And I'm so glad we're doing it on the podcast. Yeah, I know. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> it's taken a while to organise. Yeah, yeah. Well, my hardest interview uh, so far, as in logistics and timing. I did want to ask you, you mentioned it a couple of times. We've talked about taking action, some of the mindsets that you use. Sometimes if you don't know what to do, do something anyway, because that will lead you onto, onto the next thing. Yeah. And But you, I know you also plan and there's that expression, if you fail to plan, you'll plan to fail. Uh, which means if you don't have a plan or some or something, it's great to have dreams, and we all need those, and we all need those goals. And then there is the things that you can do, the, or the bridge that you can make, the plan that you can have. And it doesn't having a plan doesn't mean you stick to it no matter what. No. Having a plan is a bit like having a map to a destination. You need to do planning in your role. It's very, mm. because what I what I find interesting about what you do is not only do you do the plan for you. But you have to share that with everyone. You have to share your plan and be open and transparent about it. And this is what I'm going to do. And this is how I uh, think it's going to happen. And these are the objectives. And these are some of the challenges we might have, as well as, and here are the things I'm going to do to overcome those challenges. Can, so can you talk a bit more about your planning process and how that's evolved and how it is today and some of the feedback that you get on your plan? Because I, I know you get some really good feedback. Yeah, I do. And sometimes that feedback, you can just go, oh, damn it, I just missed that. Or, but then you've just got to stop your own emotions and just be open to that feedback. So, and I, I have, I have planning on a regular basis. I think that's all about, it's pretty self evident, but it's become more and more important uh, in my career as I have matured. I understand the value more about it. And being sometimes granular and also opening it up to the rest of the team and being quite not prescriptive, but you know, there's so much what what happens in our daily lives, there's so much noise, you know, like you want something done and then a thousand other tasks come in. 
So you've got to be very diligent in making sure that you get, particularly is because I, I have a broader team, I, I'm very clear in what I ask because then I'm clear in what I get back. And then I've got to leave it to other people to help them deliver. But if I'm not clear, that's what I've actually learned. If I'm not clear in my asks, then you just get back something that's maybe substandard. And then that then goes back into my plan because I have to report upwards and those managers then have to report upwards and on a global basis. It's just become more and more important and being quite granular and specific and then follow up. So how do you hold yourself accountable? That's the other thing is it's not just putting a plan, like this is what I want to do and actions and timelines, but then being accountable. And then, and what I mean by that is then actually looking and saying, okay, how did I, how am I progressing against that? How's my team progressing against that? And do that on a regular basis, like check in with yourself, check in and going, you know, if you're on trying to lose weight, you know, the, I'm not saying do it on a daily basis, but hop on the scales, you know, to see the effort that you're doing, are you making a difference? And then if not, correct it. So, you know, because you can stick, you can create a plan and then it changes. So you just mm. got to be adapt to it. And then also listen to the inputs of the people or activities around you to, to put that in, because then you've got a greater chance of success of reaching the target. And I think a lot of that has to do with being accountable for your activity to say, am I actually uh, propelling forward? Am I moving forward? Have I achieved what I set out to achieve? That then gets you to the end goals of success. It's interesting what you say about accountability, right? Because as human beings, we sometimes shirk the being accountable for things because probably in the past we might have failed in that area. And so as humans, we don't want to do things that we failed at in the past. But the accountability aspect makes a massive difference. And I'm hearing, hearing a lot in the personal development world about having an accountability partner. So like you say, whether you want to get fit, whether it's in your job, whether it's, uh, I suppose, in your family, you kind of can be held accountable by, by your family in certain, certain circumstances. So you have that accountability because you, your plan is transparent. You need to formulate it with others. There's so much discipline, there's structure put in. And don't fight it. You might, the way I yeah, see right. it, is, don't spend with the, the energy. Wind. Yeah, just bend with the wind. There's no point in you know because we have to do this on, on a regular basis. There's no point in fighting it because it's it's part of my my job is to do that. And the more senior you are, the more you need to do. So bend with the wind. Don't have the negative self talk. Don't fight it. Just get on with it. Just get on with it. Just do it. I love the Nike. It's one of the best sayings in the entire world. Just do it. Yeah, it is, isn't it? And so that account, that accountability partner really helps you achieve what you want to achieve. The other thing in your world, and I don't want to be negative about this, so pull me up if I am, but it can be pretty cutthroat because you live and die on the numbers. So you've been successful because of your attitude. But if you don't achieve your targets, it's uh, pretty much uh, see you later. Yes. Yeah. So that's a, that's that's a bit motivating. As well. I guess you could it could be negative or it could be motivating. <laughs> uh, but I guess I guess for you it's motivating because you you make it happen, you get it done. One of my colleagues had gotten a, a very senior meeting in New South Wales, and I heard about that on a sales call, and I was like, well, I don't have that same equivalent meeting. I can't be out done. <laughs> by one of my colleagues. So then I picked up the phone and rang reception to get through to the, you know, the C level and and got through. So and then created a meeting out of that. Yeah, so whether or not that that wasn't motivated by loss, that was more motivated by what I can achieve. You know, if they've got it, well why can't I? And even if I hadn't have been successful in getting the meeting, which was the end goal, the initial end goal, at least I took the action to do it. And yeah, I, I, I do compete. It's a very aggressive, we're, we're talking, you know, digital transformation for some of the biggest projects in around. So there's a lot at stake. And, you know, what can I achieve to be the difference? And I still believe that people buy from people. There's a few things on that. So I learned that when I was about 10 years old. My dad, we were on this road called Princess Highway and there was a Magna and I think a Pintara across that. You've heard this story a few times. 
That was part one. In part two, Renee shares more profound insights and pivotal moments that shaped her into the powerhouse she is today. We take you further into the remarkable journey of resilience, strategy, and success with Renee Merkis. Discover how embracing change has propelled Renee's career forward and how her relentless work ethic, coupled with a passion for personal and professional growth, can inspire us all to chase our dreams with tenacity. Don't miss a chance to dive deeper, to be inspired, and to let Renee's journey motivate you to reach for the stars. Thanks for joining us on Rise and Thrive, Conversations for Greatness with John Merkus. Remember, you are loved, you are worthy, and you do matter. Embrace the journey of personal growth and motivation. Let's go out there and do something great. Follow or subscribe for more insights and inspiration every Tuesday. Until next time, stay awesome.